Well, I want to begin with something a little bit interactive. Let's have a little fun for a minute here. I'm going to rattle off some names. And I want you to think about what pops into your mind, like immediately when I say the name. You ready for this? Okay. We're going to start with Mother Teresa. What comes to mind? Maybe kind thoughts. Her name often represents compassion, help for the hurting, selflessness. Let's do the next one. Hitler. What comes to mind there? Maybe the opposite, right? Evil, cruelty, the worst of humanity. Maybe even for some of you it arouses sense of anger. If I were to say the name of the current president of the United States, that might bring different things to mind for different people, depending on your political perspectives. But in each case, when the name was spoken, it wasn't just the sound of the name or the movement of my lips that told you anything about the name, but it was the person's character, their history, their actions, their words that all brought meaning and power to the name that I spoke. That's what set them apart from all the other names. So you see here that names have a kind of power based upon the substance behind it. You say it and they bring certain feelings to mind, right? They can be used to get you into places. Name dropping, it's called. They can be used to convey a certain authority. You come in someone's name. Well, the greatest name that has the most power behind it obviously is the name of God. But not just any generic name for God, but Jesus. And we'll see in a few minutes. Jesus is the name that God exalted to be above every other name. His name is a weapon for spiritual warfare. And I'm going to show you that when you speak of it, the power of what's behind it comes into the present and does some really supernatural things. So get ready for some power from this message. First, to understand the true power of the name of Jesus, we have to see and know the significance God places in a name. All throughout the Bible, we see that people's names really represented their identity. Sometimes God changed someone's name to represent a new identity. Adam, Adam in Hebrew, means name. Not name, it means man. <laughs> Got name on my mind here. Adam means man. Eve means mother of all living. God changed Abram's name to Abraham, which means father of many nations. Jacob meant deceiver, but his name was changed to Israel, which means God prevails. So these names weren't just cute little things that sounded good, but they represented everything about who that person was at their core. Well, since the beginning, a lot of people have tried to figure out what is the one name for Almighty God? Moses asked God, who should I say sent me? And God was kind of vague about it at the time. He said, I am who I am. Years ago, before I was born again and was very wet behind the ears, you know, I think I was like 14 or something, and the internet had just come out, and I read an article on the internet that claimed it had discovered the actual name of God. And when I read it, I was so excited, I remember telling one of my neighbors, I know what God's name is. I figured it out. It's Hallowed, you know, from the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be thy name. I was so gullible. Like I said, wet behind the ears. Folks, always remember this meme that I saw on social media with a quote from Abraham Lincoln where he said, never believe everything you read on the internet. All right? It's true, okay? 
Some of you are going to get that tomorrow, but <laughs> of course today I know that hallowed means set apart, holy. It describes God's name and who He is. But do you realize that in the Bible there are more than 300 unique names for God? 300. I'm not going to name them all. We'd be here all night. But each represent a different facet of God's character or who He proved Himself to be to His people. You've got Adonai, the Lord my God. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. El Shaddai, the God who is sufficient. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. We talked about some of these, you might remember a few weeks ago in my message, The First Law of the Supernatural. But I don't just want this to be a history lesson. I believe it's important to understand what the people of the Bible believed when they spoke a name. And in Hebrew tradition, to invoke or call upon someone's name was to make that person effectively present. Get that. When they said a name, they actually believed they were making that person effectively present, especially if it was someone from the past. So in other words, when they called upon one of those unique names of God, they believed that God would present and show Himself faithful in that specific way. I mean, think about that. When they called on El Shaddai, they believed that God was coming with provision. When they called on Jehovah Rapha, they believed that God was coming with healing. So now, Jesus comes into the scene. And He's given the name, or a name, which initially is a fairly common name. I mean, Jesus is the Greek version of Joshua, and lots of people in those days, as today, were named Joshua. But Colossians 2.9 it says, for in Christ lives all the fullness, fullness of God in a human body. Now think about that. All of those 300 plus names that people had forgotten, those 300 plus ways that they had come to know Him as faithful. What that verse there says, Colossians 2.9, is that all of that, all of the ways that they knew God, the fullness of Him, was put into the flesh of the person of Christ. That's why we see in the Gospels, when a demon-possessed person happens upon Jesus, He never has to say anything to them or even tell them who He is or convince them of His authority. They immediately recognized Him as God in the flesh so that when Jesus said, Go! They instantly obeyed Him. He didn't even have to say His name. He didn't have to say, go in Jesus' name, because it was His presence that contained the full power of God that they recognized, and they had to go when He said go. It's His presence that did the deliverance. Okay. So after faithfully finishing everything that He was sent to do here on earth, the Bible says that God elevated this common name, Jesus, representing the person of Jesus, to one of the highest names of authority and honor. Philippians 2, starting in verse 9, it says, Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So at this moment, when Jesus did what he came to do, his name was matched to the person, the authority of who he is, and the accomplishment of everything he had done. Are you tracking with me here? The name was matched to the substance. I remember one time I was sick of dealing with some things in my life, and I felt like I had prayed every prayer. 
and I had made every declaration of victory and I had cast out every devil and I just didn't know what to say anymore. I said, God, what, what more do I need to say? What more do I need to pray? And God said, just say Jesus. Say Jesus over your situations because Jesus' name contains more power than any string of words that you could put together. I said, Jesus' name contains more power than any string of words that you can put together. And that might be a word for some of you watching right now. You're at your wit's end and you just don't have the words anymore. What more can I pray, Lord? I'm out of words to say. Well, there's no de greater declaration of victory than to look at a situation and say, in the name of Jesus. Because Jesus' name represents everything, everything about who he is and what he had done. Get this, Jesus is salvation. Jesus is healing. Jesus is deliverance. Jesus is peace. Jesus is protection. Jesus is provision. And his name is above any name, any person, any place, anything. If it has a name, I don't care if it's cancer. I don't care if it's depression. I don't care if it's anxiety. I don't care if it's stress. If it has a name, declare the name above all names. Just say Jesus and believe that you have just brought his presence and power into the midst of whatever it is you're declaring it into. In Jesus' name, everything's got to bow down. That ought to make somebody shout. Now, I can hear some of your skeptical minds wandering through the screen. Can we really use Jesus' name like that? Yes! Because we believers are the bride of Christ. And by becoming His bride, we take on His name. And we get to use the rewards of everything he achieved because of what he had done. It's just like when you're married. What's yours is theirs and what's theirs is yours. Some of you are saying, that's not how my marriage works. <laughs> what's mine is theirs, but what's theirs is not mine. <laughs> I understand that today some situations are a bit different, but generally speaking... People who are married share the same bank account, the same money, so that you get to use the reward from the work that your spouse has done. You get to sign checks on their behalf. You get to make medical decisions on their behalf as good as if they had made the decision themselves. Well, it's your union with Christ from salvation that gives you the power to use His name and to see results as if he were there himself. Speaking to his followers about what would happen after he leaves and ascends to heaven, Jesus said in John 14, verse 12, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything, anything, in my name, and I will do it. Now, they were sad at that time because Jesus was leaving. But what he was telling them there is that they would be better off with him gone because he had delegated to each of them the power of his name. Before, he was one man in flesh, in one place at any given time. And now he had delegated his name and with it his presence and power to bring him into any circumstance or situation. I bring this verse up talking about marriage because effectively using Jesus' name requires intimacy with him. You can't use Jesus' name just to get whatever you want. It's not some magical formula that an unbeliever can just use to go poof, 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 and just suddenly things appear like that. What Jesus is saying is you can ask for anything in my name and I will do it. Meaning, you can ask for anything according to who I am, according to what I've done, 
according to what you know about my character, my will, my history, and I will do it. That's what Jesus is saying. And only someone in an intimate relationship with someone can know those kinds of things about a person in order to know what they can ask for. My close friends know that they can ask me for certain things and I'll do it. But my close friends also know because they're my close friends and they've spent time with me that they can ask me for certain things that I'm not going to do because it would be outside of my character. They can't get me to rob a bank. They can't get me to steal a car. They can't get me to drink coffee and they know it. <laughs> but they can ask me to preach a message. They could ask me to take them to the airport. They could ask me to help someone in need. That's according to my character, what they know about me. Well, it's the same with using Jesus' name. You can ask for things in His name and He'll do them because you know Him. You're in union with Him. You know what He'll do and what He won't do. So you can say peace in Jesus' name, joy in Jesus' name, provision in Jesus' name, protection in Jesus' name, salvation for sure in Jesus' name, and you can be sure He'll provide those things. Okay. So we've seen that we can use Jesus' name to get certain things according to His character. But as ones in Christ, we also get the authority of who He is to stop certain things and command certain things, which is where it's really powerful as a weapon. Luke 10, 19. Jesus says, Look, I have given you authority, important word there, authority over all the power of the enemy. And... As one in Christ, you've been given clothing. Galatians 3.27 says, And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. I like to think about our clothing in Christ like a uniform. A uniform represents authority. A uniform tells people whether they have to listen or not. <laughs> in my book, Silent Satan, I tell a story about a YouTube video I once watched. It was a man dressed in regular clothes. He's stood out in a parking lot, pleading with shoppers to do all kinds of weird things. I mean, like switching their grocery bags around in their hands and jumping up on one foot and just all kinds of goofy stuff on their way to the car. Everyone thought he was crazy. Of course. They gave his, no re or they gave his request no extra thoughts until he changed the uniform. He put on a uniform of a security guard, of a police officer. Oh, then people took him seriously. It conveyed authority. He got to convince them to throw wrappers on the ground and to change the way they walk, all kinds of things. Just because the uniform conveyed authority, which changed everything about what they responded to. And it's the same in our spiritual battles. You see, you and I are nothing in and of ourselves. When the enemy comes against us in and of ourselves, we can't get him to do anything. We're like that person dressed in regular clothes, and the devil says, who are you? But as one's clothed in Christ, flashing the badge of the name of Jesus, we get the authority behind his name, which can make the devil do backflips if we want. Because when we command something in Jesus' name, it's as good as if God was commanding Himself because the presence of Jesus arrives on the scene. In His commission to the disciples, the end of Mark, Mark 16, He says, And these signs will accompany those who believe by using My name. That's the key. By using my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes in their hands. If they drink anything deadly, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. In his name. So let's look closer at the idea there, the first one. 
They will cast out devils in Jesus' name. It's exactly what we see reported all throughout Scripture, that using his name there would be deliverance. Luke 10, 17, the disciples returned to Jesus boasting, Lord, even demons are subject to us in your name. And many today can report the same. I'll tell you a personal story here that I kind of hesitate to tell you because just by telling this, some people might label me a certain kind of minister. But understand, I don't consider myself to have a deliverance ministry in the sense that I'm consistently called on to deliver people from demons or do exorcisms and things like that. In a different sense, maybe I do consider myself having a deliverance ministry because I think most of the work of the enemy is in our minds. Really, the only power he has on a Christian is to deceive us. So in order to overcome the devil's work, we have to bring truth. So what I'm doing here, what I do with preaching the word is I bring truth. That's a form of deliverance, really, even though people don't quite equate it that way often. But in the sense of somebody who's oppressed or something like that, If a situation presents itself and I'm there and I can help, I'm going to help. Just like if you know CPR and somebody needs it right where you are, you're going to help. So one time there was a young boy in our area who had dabbled into some very dark stuff and was clearly exhibiting signs of needing deliverance. And I was close enough to the boy's family that they had asked me, what do we do? So to make a very long story short... (laughs) we decided to arrange a dinner for the purpose of getting to deliverance. And at the time, everything about the boy was fairly calm for about the first half of the dinner. Nothing really unusual. But as I started to mention the name of Jesus, everything began to shift. I mean, he got fidgety. He got really restless. Obviously, something was being provoked in him that did not like that name. And let's just say it brought him to a point where we could get the things out. Because we spoke in the name of Jesus. Now, understand, it doesn't have to be as radical as a demonic possession of a person. But it can be when you sense the enemy in a situation or a circumstance in your life. You can cast out a bad attitude, and maybe some of you need to do that. Say, bad attitude, go in Jesus' name. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5, talk about this verse a lot, but it says that we can take captive, rebellious thoughts and bring them into obedience to Christ. So in other words, God gives us the authority to arrest, literally arrest, rebellious thoughts, and then command them to go in Jesus' name. You can say, "Uh uh-uh, thought, you're not living in here. Go in Jesus' name. Another big area is for healing, physical healing. He said, in my name, you will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And Jesus said, and Scripture is pretty clear all throughout, that God is a healer. One of the names in the Old Testament, Jehovah Rapha, is God our healer. And that is not just talking about spiritual and emotional healing. And I know I get a lot of, probably some of the most heat that I will get from people is over this. Because for some reason, people get offended by the idea that Jesus actually heals. I don't understand it, but they do. But you can look it up in the Old Testament. When Jehovah Rapha was mentioned, or the word Rapha, healer, healing, was mentioned, like in Isaiah, when it says, by the wounds of Christ we were healed, it's talking about physical stuff too. I can't get into an entire teaching on healing right now, but invoking Jesus' name over a sickness, symptom, or something that's wrong with your body has the power to bring His presence into it. The apostles discovered this. In a big way. In Acts 3, Peter and John were on their way to the temple when they came across a man who was lame from birth, begging them for money. 
And Peter responded to the man's cry in Acts 3, 6. Peter says, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but what I have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. Get up and walk in the name. They spoke in the name of Jesus and the man was instantly healed. And when onlookers questioned and were amazed, like, what just happened? Peter said it was through faith in the name of Jesus the man was healed. You see, when they used the name, power struck. Jesus' presence arrived on the scene, and His presence did the work to cast out the infirmity in the man. I want you to notice something. Think of it as you read through Scripture, and especially in Acts, the Gospels. Every time Jesus prayed for healing, or the apostles prayed for healing, they didn't pray in the sense that we think. They didn't say, Lord, please heal this person. Please touch this person. No, they understood His will for healing from spending time with Him. So they knew it was something He wanted to do. So they didn't need to ask Him, Lord, is it your will? They knew that by declaring His name, they would enact His will for it. So instead of, oh, my gracious Heavenly Father, if it be thy will, please touch sister so-and-so. They declared healing in Jesus' name. And we can do the same because that authority is delegated to us as the bride of Christ. Now, I'm going to challenge you with this, and I know it's difficult. It's difficult sometimes for me, too, because we've been conditioned to pray in a certain way. Tradition has been ingrained in us. But do your best. It won't be perfect probably, but do your best to get into the habit of declaring healing using Jesus' name. Like, headache be gone in Jesus' name. Symptom go in Jesus' name. Body be healed in Jesus' name. It's not commanding God to do something. I think that's, people think it's irreverent sometimes because you're commanding God. No, what you're doing is you're bringing forth what He already has provided. That's another teaching. But declare Jesus' name and trust that His presence is there doing whatever work is best and then leave the results to Him. Declare Jesus' name in emergencies and crisis. Crises. When it's a split-second thing and there's nothing else to say, sometimes the best thing, as I said earlier, is just to say Jesus. Back when I lived in North Florida, I had a pastor there, and he's not really a man of hype, so I have no reason to doubt what he told us, but he told a story years ago of how he and his wife were driving, and something happened to where they were about to run smack dab into the back of a vehicle at like 60 miles an hour. It looked like a sure thing, and all they had time to say at the moment was, Jesus. And the next thing they knew, they're on the other side of the vehicle. No crash, nothing. I mean, that's mind-boggling. And I know some of you, <laughs> you're probably listening to some of my stories and you're thinking, I don't know about all of this. Well, you don't have to know about it. The name of Jesus is no ordinary name. It's hallowed. It's set apart. It's above every other name. When the name of Jesus is spoken, you're calling on the presence of God Himself. Supernatural things should happen. It's not always going to make sense to your natural mind. And that's a good thing. That's why God gives it to us to use in the first place, because we need it to do something that we can't do. God gives us supernatural weapons because we need it. Because we can't do it. So whatever it is that you need, whether it's peace, deliverance, thoughts to be gone, healing to happen, 
you're in a crisis, if you need to shut up the devil's accusations, as long as you're in relationship with him, use his name and watch it go to work to bring about his will. Are you in the middle of a mental, emotional, or spiritual struggle? Here's some good news. God has provided a way to beat that battle today. Yes, you have access right now to spiritual armor, complete with six supernatural weapons that ensure victory in any circumstance. Ready to powerfully access and activate this armor? I've created an in-depth interactive e-course to show you how. The Armor of God e-course includes six dynamic video lessons in which I reveal how to effectively use the weapons outlined in Ephesians 6 to radically shift from chaos to calm, fear to faith, sorrow to joy, and battle to triumph. It's an eye-opening, illustrated exploration of the armor of God that unlocks all the victory Jesus died to give you. This e-course isn't just something you watch, but it's an immersive experience with which you interact. Each lesson includes a 16-minute video teaching, a lesson guide with reflection questions and application tips, and a discussion forum where I interact with you. The Armor of God e-course is available for you to join in on today. Simply visit kylewinkler.org armor to get started. And because the six lesson e-course streams entirely online, there's nothing you have to wait for to arrive. Begin instantly from any internet connected computer, tablet, or smartphone, and continue at your own pace from wherever you are. You no longer have to be under attack, but you can live on the attack. And I want to show you the way. Join me now to discover how to access and activate the armor of God to beat your battles today. Visit kylewinkler.org armor to get started. And I'll see you there.